From Washington, the McLaughlin Group, the American original. For over three decades, the sharpest minds, best sources, hardest talk. Hello, welcome to another edition of the McLaughlin Group. I'm your host, Tom Rogan. Joining us this week are the familiar faces of Eleanor Clift, Clarence Page, and Pat Buchanan. And our guest this week is Kaylee McGee from the Washington Examiner. Welcome, Kaylee. Thanks on for having note, me. On that note, we shall get to our first issue, which is issue one, Trump train. But it's very interesting when they have protests, that's okay. When they have violence, when they have anarchists, and they have agitators, that's okay. The governor of Nevada should not be in charge of ballots. The ballots are going to be a disaster for our country. The Trump campaign rumbled on this week with President Trump rejecting criticism for holding an indoor rally in Nevada. Trump says that was only necessary because Nevada's Democratic governor, Steve Sisolak, refused to provide a permit for an outdoor rally. Trump also used his attack on Sisolak to advance one of his other top campaign narratives, namely that postal ballots cannot be trusted. Regardless, the Trump train seems to be gaining steam in the key swing states of Florida, Wisconsin and North Carolina. Oh, and Trump's favorability rating, now at just over 43%, has also risen since July. Pat, how much should we read into this notion that President Trump uh, is staging a late comeback into this race? Tom, I'll tell you what the situation is right now. It is very similar to Truman versus Dewey in 48. Truman's the president of the United States. He's embattled under attack. The elites have deserted him. He's attacking Dewey. Dewey is running a you know, moderate centrist campaign. And of course, that turned out very well for the incumbent president. Now, there's two areas and avenues of attack on Trump's part. One is that Biden lacks the physical energy and the mental acuity to be president of the United States. And the second is that given his sort of absentee candidacies, the people taking over the direction of the campaign and who will take over the country are AOC, they're the Bernie folks, they're Black Lives Matter, even Antifa, and of course, the Harris-Biden ticket as I think Joe Biden himself said. So I think that's the, it, those are the two avenues of attack for Trump and the debates will determine the outcome, I think of those attacks and maybe of the election. Eleanor, do you believe President Trump uh, is, is putting Joe Biden in a precarious position now? Well, first of all, comparing uh, Trump to Harry Truman, it's not as bad or as insulting as Trump comparing himself to Churchill and FDR. But I think that's a bit of a reach. I think uh, you know, the president has had some success elevating and even and even stoking uh, violence in some cities in promising that he's going to have a vaccine delivered uh, by the end of October, conveniently right before Election Day, which, of course, a lot of public health people are questioning and questioning the legitimacy of the election itself and fueling lots of suits around the country uh, to suppress the vote. So that, that's his strategy. And then to pretend he's running against uh, Bernie Sanders, I think uh, Biden has some work to do. He needs to be more declarative about where he stands. He said, uh, look at me, uh, am I, do I look like a, a socialist with a soft spot for rioters? He's got to say that more than once. And I think the reason he hasn't closed the deal during the summer, it looked like he was heading for a landslide. We now have a tighter race, but I don't think that Trump has fundamentally changed the trajectory of the race. And I think the first debate, which is now less than two weeks away, uh, could reframe the, the, the race favorably for Biden, or it could uh, elevate uh, Trump. Kaylee, your thoughts? Well, I think that any talk of a comeback by the Republicans or any talk of a sweeping victory by the Democrats, both are premature at this point, because the fact is that we have no idea what to expect with the influx of mail-in voting that is going to occur in November. We're talking about not even hearing results from really important swing states like Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin for weeks afterwards. And we don't know how many people are going to take advantage of this um, accessible voting. So it's really unclear which way that this is gonna swing. And so any talk of a definitive answer is, is really premature. Clarence, one of the things that the, the Trump campaign uh, would suggest is that they have this new momentum with security and, 
and you know there, there's light at the end of the tunnel with COVID, and yet President Trump still seems to throw up his own curveballs in his way with remarks that you know sometimes you really can't understand where they came from. Is that Joe Biden's key advantage? Uh, I, I want to, first of all, I, I thank Pat for bringing up the 1948 uh, uh, Dewey and Truman uh, race. Uh, that was the one you'll remember when was my newspaper uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, just reported Dewey beats big Truman. headlines, Dewey defeats Truman. I've got a T-shirt with that on the front. Uh, and, and of course, it's been brought up every time we talk about polls in presidential races. Uh, in some ways, uh, uh, Trump pulled off a Dewey defeats Truman kind of victory four years ago uh, in the Electoral College, just barely. Uh, right now, uh, when you look at the, how well uh, Biden was doing this summer, uh, uh, we expected the race to tighten up more than it has, but uh, it, it tightened up because of, of uh, something unpredicted, which is these riots on the street giving uh, uh, Mr. Trump a, uh, a new campaign issue. But remarkably, he didn't really do that much with it. Uh, the numbers are still about where they were a, a month or so ago. And one waits to see what Trump is going to come up with next. But so far, he's spending a lot of time uh, talking about how the coronavirus isn't really something to worry about, which plays better for him and his base than it does for swing voters. But we haven't seen uh, that big of a dramatic swing there either. You know, one of the things that has been interesting here is that, you know, I would have expected more optimism about the idea of, you know, getting at least one of these vaccines in before the election. Uh, which at least one of the big pharmaceutical companies has suggested would be possible. And yet Democrats seem very negative about that. Is that because they rightly you know, have a you know, rationale to say that President Trump cares more about his election than the public health of the nation? Or do you think you know, Democrats really fear that that might create a positive mindset for President Trump just before election day? I think there's obviously on the part of the Democrats, I mean, look, they see this thing within their grasp. And President Trump has been talking about a vaccine coming in, and clearly he's been raising the hopes of the American people. And I think, quite frankly, that the Democrats are trying to sort of dash those hopes. They would say they're being realistic about it, but it also comes across as being negative. And so the thing, though, about Biden here is that Biden ran an excellent strategy. I mean, he was put in the basement, coronavirus, coronavirus did it. And, but it was also done by design and necessity, and it worked extremely well. But as some of the other panelists have been saying, now he's been forced out, and now he's sort of got unsteady. He gave up his, you know, his, his real long lead, and now it's closing a bit, and he looks like a candidate that's scrambling. Eleanor, your thoughts? <laughs> yeah. Uh, has a show ever gone by where Pat has not done the Biden in the basement meme? <laughs> Uh, he, he, who has come out, Ellen. lowered the bar for Biden. If Pat, he, he's out there, Pat. If he manages to walk by himself to the podium and put a sentence together, it will be victory. Uh, he, he was always going to come out of the basement. He was always going to campaign more. But he's not going to do rallies and putting people together like uh, sardines in order to spread the coronavirus. And the president's going to continue to portray that as strength versus weakness, I don't think that uh, succeeds. But the president has basically silenced his public health experts. He got into a fight with the head of the CDC uh, this week who said that a virus would not be distributed Vaccine. widely until the middle of 2021. He's relying on a radiologist that he first saw on Fox TV. Uh, so I think there's genuine concern in the medical community uh, whether safety and efficacy will be followed. And uh, people are afraid. They don't want to be guinea pigs. We've had some problems with vaccines in the past. And if you don't get enough people taking a vaccine and it's not a 100% effective vaccine, uh, it might not, might not work. And so these are, these, these are genuine, right. legitimate concerns. Kaylee, do you think there might be an opportunity to thread the needle here? I mean, I think it would be unlikely for President Trump to put something out there that actually did endanger people simply because of the procedural elements of doing that. And also it would be so catastrophic for the longer term. I mean, who knows though? Do you think there's an opportunity that, that perhaps the drug, if it came the week before the election, you could say, if you want to take it, you can take it. 
but we're not pressuring. Absolutely. And what you were saying before, I mean, the FDA has a rigorous process that private companies must adhere to. It includes several trials, multiple testings um, in order for a vaccine to be even rolled out. And obviously, there is some sort of concern that even Dr. Fauci has raised himself, where he said, you know, if we push a vaccine too soon, there is a question of public legitimacy. Um, and those are legitimate concerns. But at the same time, we have to trust that the process exists for a reason. And there is absolutely no evidence to support that President Trump is flouting that process or that he would even try to do so, especially when the stakes are so high. Yeah, uh, just to add quickly, as a, as a backup plan, the president said he's got a uh, health care coverage for all that he's about to announce. He can't tell us who's working on it or when it will come out, but you know he's making a lot of groundless okay. promises uh, because he's thinking about the election. I don't think you can say that that's not true. Final word to Clarence. <laughs> uh, oh, did you, was there a question to go along with that? <laughs> Well, I would you on this vaccine point? What do you think is the political exigency of the vaccine? Well, first of all, the president has had his health care plan about to come out, Eleanor, for about six or seven months now. Right. Uh, not to mention the promises he made four years ago, but he's going to come out up with a plan that'll be cheaper and 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 a more effective covering everybody. Republicans can't even come to a consensus on what what to do about the health care issue. Uh, president Trump uh, says. Uh, he's talking about about now. Well, maybe as early as as uh, 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 next month, maybe <laughs> maybe uh, late October. Uh, I mean, what right before election day is what he's saying. That's six weeks and and change. Uh, we're not going to have a vaccine by November, ladies and gentlemen. All right. But but if I he keeps saying that, he's not helping himself at all. He's only hurting himself, and he's um, uh, trivializing this issue. Okay. Come Let, on, let's Clarence, move on to the other. Alive. All right, let's move on to the other side of the coin. Other side of the coin, issue two, Biden's bandwagon. We need a president who respects science, who understands that the damage from climate change is already here. And unless we take urgent action, it will soon be more catastrophic. Joe Biden rebuked President Trump's questioning of human-induced climate change this week. Biden also toured Florida as his campaign grows concerned about his narrowing lead in the key swing state. While Hillary Clinton won the 2016 Florida Hispanic vote by more than 25 percentage points, an NBC Morris poll released last week suggests Trump is up by four percentage points with Florida Hispanics. Still, Biden continues to hold commanding leads in national polls and in other swing states such as Pennsylvania. Eleanor, your thoughts on where the Biden campaign goes from here? Well, he's got some weaknesses, and actually, uh, uh, Pat has identified one of those, and that is lacks the energy for the job. So the president's uh, relentless pushing of that issue has has taken its toll. Uh, secondly, he does have some weaknesses with his Hispanics, and they are a large portion of the electorate in Florida. But Trump won in Florida by a single percentage point in 2016, and. Uh, Biden has some work to do with Hispanics, but you know, he's doing very well with senior citizens and uh, people over 65 have gotten the message that they're on the front lines of the coronavirus here and the president uh, doesn't seem to be uh, doing uh, much to help them. We, we've got a very rocky ride ahead. Um, and, uh, you know, Biden is, is being uh, careful and uh, there's a lot of misinformation that's going on uh, out there as well. And I think that's also part of the Trump campaign. All right, Pat. Biden's being more than careful. Uh, every time you see him when he comes out, and it's not all that often, he's reading off a teleprompter, he's slow, he's didactic, and there's no energy and no fire. And even the Democrats are now talking about this I mean, lack of energy that he's got, and he's got to get over that. Again, I go back to the point, it was a very successful strategy he managed for six months. If he wins this election, it will be the very fact that he pulled out of it for a while, got out of the news and let Trump be beaten. But I think now he's hit at a point from what he is doing himself, that his team knows it's got a problem and it's got to persuade people. But the problem is 
He is not terribly persuasive reading from a teleprompter, especially when he's asked a question and then says, move the prompter up to give the answer. Okay, Clarence. Well, uh, Joe Biden is not Pat Buchanan, who was an excellent speech maker when, when Pat ran for president back in 92. I'll, I'll never forget that a great New Hampshire campaign. Unfortunately, the campaign ended not short, long after that. Uh, there's a, a, a fact going on right now that we can see across the country that people who are, who are saying they prefer Biden are really anti-Trump to a large degree. Uh, and that has been a big help for for Biden along the road here. Uh, I think at the same time in Florida, uh, the very fact that we're talking about Florida is significant because Biden doesn't need Florida the way things are going and the polls, mm -hmm. uh, indeed the upper Midwest uh, is, is more crucial for him right now. Uh, but uh, uh, Trump won by such a narrow margin uh, and uh, uh, Biden is doing well with seniors, guess why? <laughs> A coronavirus issue, the healthcare issue, is big in that state. It is interesting, isn't it, that in Florida, one of the salient factors that seems to have perhaps alienated some of these Hispanic voters from Joe Biden is the Trump campaign narrative that the Democratic Party has run to the left. And, and we think about, obviously, the legacy of Cuba with it, strongly in the minds of many of those voters. You know, it's interesting that that, that seems to be playing off in some regard. Absolutely. And not just in Florida, this narrative that the Trump campaign is pushing is working in the Hispanic community at large. Trump had a campaign event down in Arizona last week and a couple of the, um, I read a report about interviewing several of the attendees and they said that, believe it or not, they actually support Trump's immigration policies because they were immigrants themselves once and they support the American dream, but they want people to pursue it in the right way. And so it, it's appealing to these voters to have someone who they believe is fighting for them and fighting for the right to pursue opportunity um, and to hear Joe Biden, you know, cozying up to people who might take that away in their eyes. That's that's a big red flag for these voters. And okay. to the point about the polls and his numbers, I would just say, personally, I'm still very skeptical of the numbers. I think 2016 proved that we all should be. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. All right. And Cla Louis Clarence, Louis Truman. Because, Clarence, because you were such a, a, as you always are, gentlemen, last week, I will give you the final word. Well, I think that uh, uh, indeed uh, uh, Florida is important. Uh, polls aren't everything. But uh, right now, uh, Biden is indeed, somebody said, uh, uh, I'd rather be, be in Biden's position than Trump's position right now. Uh, I certainly would. Uh, the trending has been very solid. And, and unless we see a big October surprise, I expect they're going to stay that way. Yeah, okay. uh, this, is, this is Eleanor. That somebody was me who said that. <laughs> right. I just want to say that... Uh, a re-election campaign is always a referendum on the incumbent, and this incumbent will be judged on an epic failure to respond to the coronavirus, to a social justice uh, reform okay. movement, and the warnings of climate change that were driven home this week in very stark fashion. Okay, we'll move on. Issue three, Abraham Accords. They are choosing a future in which Arabs and Israelis, Muslims, Jews, and Christians can live together, pray together, and dream together, side by side in harmony, community, and peace. President Trump's communications team might have added a soaring musical overlay to that video, but it's hard to blame them. After all, on Tuesday, the leaders of Israel, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates established full diplomatic relations brokered by the Trump administration. The deal illustrates rising cooperation between the former devoted enemies, and it reflects a recentering of concern towards Iran. In a rare moment of bipartisan unity, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi also praised the peace accord. Clarence. A big success for President Trump that much of the media seems determined to ignore, no? Well, I think everybody recognizes that this is an, a, a success, uh, but uh, what does it do for the Palestinians? No, nothing. It actually sets them back. Uh, up until now, uh, in, in the Middle East balance, uh, uh, they've been a, been, a, been a pivotal factor because uh, what was keeping the Arab alliance together was support for a Palestinian state. That obviously has been dealt a big setback now. Uh, and uh, also uh, we have a, uh, a, a, a situation now in, in which a new alliance will be uh, put together uh, here and uh, the, the Saudis must 
uh, support this plan also, or it wouldn't be happening with uh, Bahrain. Uh, but this is not a peace agreement because there's not a war going on between these countries that are signing this agreement. So it, it's more of a, 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 something closer to a trade agreement and a, a diplomatic arrangement. Pat, your thoughts? Well, look, when Trump went to Jerusalem and moved the American embassy there, then he recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Then he recognized Israel's control of the Golan Heights and its annexation there. Everyone said he is dead in the Arab world. This does it. He's finished. And all of a sudden, you got the UAE and Bahrain recognizing Israel and doing it at the White House. I think this is a clear diplomatic victory for the president. However, I don't know, and it is a defeat for the Palestinians undeniably. They've basically been told, look, you're not gonna prevent us from working with the Americans and against the Iranians. However, take a look, Tom, there's still a civil war going on in Syria, a bloody one, civil war going on in Yemen, civil war going on in Libya, civil war going on in Afghanistan, and there's no real true peace in Iraq. So that whole place is still in deep, deep trouble. And I think this is a success that we ought not to go overboard and think of peace is, a, is at hand in the Middle East. No, th this was uh, the main driver here was uh, Netanyahu, who really needed this for his, his uh, very uh, stressed political career. And he's in the midst of a trial about corruption. So it's, it, he really pushed it. Uh, and it, it is a great gift to him. But it's a recognition of business arrangements in, in the Middle East has nothing to do with war and peace. It has nothing to do with ideology. And uh, that's a good thing that I think that um, President and Jared Kushner, who was the main negotiator here, recognized the new alliances in the Middle East and that they could uh, get some diplomatic benefit out. That's a good thing. The problems are it may set off an arms race in the, in the Middle East because you do have the UAE wanting uh, fighter jets and, and Israel doesn't want that. Uh, and you have some promises made that may not be kept. And that is, will uh, Israel back off on, the, on ax, annexing the West Bank? That's part of the deal. I'm not so sure they're gonna deliver on that. Haley. I think that the tone of the conversation would be much different if any other president had signed this deal or helped broker it, to be honest. I think that this is a huge deal, regardless of whether it's a peace agreement or whether it's a trade negotiation. I mean, this is the first time in 25 years that an Arab nation has sat down with Israel and recognized the country, let alone signed a deal with them. So yes, it was largely economic. It was largely about trade and opening up these conversations for the future. But it's an important step forward that hopefully means that they'll be able to settle their differences in conversational ways rather than shooting rockets at each other in the days forward. So I think it's a big deal. I think it's really sad that we're not treating it as such. Um, and yeah, the media has recognized it, but there's always the but afterwards. And I don't think that there needs to be a but. One of the things that is interesting, though, is that with the UAE and Bahrain, you know, these are not democratic countries. And, and if they were, one wonders whether the same agreement would have been come to. Um, I do think, though, to some degree, it does reflect a repudiation of the Obama administration's effort to create rapprochement with Iran in the sense that all three of these nations clearly now believe whatever their disagreements on the Palestinians and other issues, political Islam, Iran is the, the nemesis. We shall see what happens if Joe Biden wins. Um, one final thing that Pat mentioned, the new prime minister in Iraq, Mustafa al Kanami, is a good guy, former head of their National Intelligence Service, the first non-sectarian leader they've had in a while. So there is some hope there. Anyway, I'll shut up. Predictions, Pat. Uh, this goes to what you've been saying. I think there's going to be some kind of military action between the United States and or Israel and Iran in October of this year, because those folks on the Persian Gulf who came to Washington to recognize Israel, they didn't do this simply for a good trade deal. But I think they want to line up with the Americans and the Israelis in what they see coming, which could be a major military collision with Iran in the Middle East. That's, that's, we'll have to cover that. That's a, you might be right about that. Eleanor. Well, that would be, a, a, that would qualify as an October surprise, I guess. <laughs> yes, uh, it would. Yep. yes uh, it would, Eleanor. <laughs> yes, and, uh, uh, because maybe the one that, uh, that uh, the Trump was counting on is fizzling out, and that is the um, investigation by John Durham, the U.S. attorney. His lead uh, prosecutor resigned uh, 
uh, amid questions of political uh, interference. And uh, so whatever comes out of there is gonna have a taint about it. But hey, I, I think we've got, <laughs> we've got a lot of surprises ahead before we get to November 3rd. Kaylee. Well, I think that this is kind of a post um, election prediction, but I think that if Trump were to win re-election, I think you'll see several top members of the administration leave. Would not surprise me at all if Education Secretary Betsy DeVos left or Attorney General Bill Barr. Um, would not surprise me if they didn't decide to stay on an additional four years, but obviously Trump would have to win for that to happen. Okay, Clarence. Well, this, this past week, President Trump was uh, waging a new war against blue states, saying that the, that they have this this rapidly rising uh, coronavirus rate. Actually, the uh, 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 the, the biggest rises that are occurring in, in, in red states here in the last few days. I think if uh, we continue to see this cultural divide over masks, uh, we're going to see even more of a of a rise in red states. I'm not hoping for that to happen; quite the opposite. But uh, President Trump is, is uh, waging a war against science. Okay, on, on the October surprise foreign policy front, I predict that there is a good chance that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo may visit Taiwan before the election, which would be a big deal in the sense that it might end up with a war for an invasion of Taiwan. So we will see on that count. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. We will see you next week.